because illegal immigration and drug smuggling is a fact of life on the U.S.-Mexico border. Employees take extra precautions before they head to the field to avoid trouble. First, they talk about the importance of getting to know the area. Any new employee goes through an orientation. And, you know, they've already been appraised of the situation. They will ride along with other staff members in the field. They'll get a feel for the country. They'll even maybe ride along with law enforcement, not in a law enforcement capacity, but to help learn the area. We, we have an area that is rather difficult to learn. The roads are few. The distances are great. It may take you all day to get across the refuge, for instance. So we're concerned that an employee knows where they are and if they need help when they radio in, they can adequately articulate to law enforcement how to get to them. If you're a new employee on a border district, your best bet is to go to that person that's been around for a long time and has seen the changes, the fluctuations, has seen the, the things that are hard to see and pick their brain. Next, employees stress the central role communications play in keeping them safe along the border. It is. That level of communication is real important because our experience here has been that dangerous situations are going to be things that you encounter suddenly and can kind of spiral out of control very quickly. So it's very important that somebody knows where you are at all times and that if you do get into any kind of a, a questionable situation that you alert somebody to it immediately so that they know that something may be happening in a certain area and people can be ready to mobilize if they have to. Things that I'm looking for when I come into a site are, do I have cell phone coverage? What kinds of communication forms do I have before I ever get out of the vehicle? If I know I don't have cell phone coverage, then I need to have something else with me if I'm going to leave that vehicle. I do carry a satellite phone and a handheld radio. There's normally backup radio systems uh, when employees are out. There's a mobile unit in the vehicle. There's also a, a handheld unit. And if they're overnighting in more remote areas, there's also satellite phone with them as well. So there are uh, multiple options for communication. In many situations, employees emphasize the importance of safety in numbers. As often as I can, I have someone out there with me, especially if I know I'm going to be in some more remote country or a country I might not be as familiar with. This district has a lot of two-track roads that go out to tanks and stop, and the brush is thick. There's not a lot of turnaround, and when I'm by myself, I generally don't take those because I don't know what's going to be at the end. It might be a drop-off site. could be anybody out there. could be trafficking humans, trafficking drugs, so I generally won't take those, but if I'm with a the buddy, then they can be watching and, you know, manning a radio or something, and I can still at least get my job done and stay somewhat safe. I don't walk that way. I may not have come out here. If I didn't have law enforcement, uh, if I didn't have uh, someone else with me, a uh, co-worker, I wouldn't come out. Uh, I wouldn't risk it. It's too isolated. If something were to happen to me, it'd be hours before I, anything would be discovered. And I'm not going to jeopardize myself like that. Employees also stress the agency's policies on check-in and check-out are particularly important when working near the border. We monitor our employees. They put in their names, their destination, and the time they're going to be in the field on a checkout board. In certain areas, they check in every half an hour or hour, depending upon the area that they're in. And if there's no check-in, then the monitor will call them by radio and determine that they're OK. And if there's no response, we have an immediate protocol that our law enforcement immediately responds to the area to find them. Other areas have a little bit less of a risk. They're known areas for layup sites. And in some of those places, what we've done is we have a monitoring system where our, our staff have to check in with the law enforcement officer, tell them where they're going, uh, what vehicle they're in, when they'll be out, you know, that kind of thing, so that our law enforcement officers can check up on them. They don't have to accompany them, but they know, okay, the biologist is in this area, I'm going to keep my eye out and listen, and then they have to check out when they come back out. 
We also need to, it's a, a policy that when we're out in the field in remote areas that if I'm going to exit the vehicle, I uh, call in and say I'm going to be now leaving the vehicle. I plan to be out 30 minutes and I'm in a certain area. And so they know, and especially um, if I'm by myself, and then I'll turn around. And, and I may not have to be even in the border, near the border. I can be, you know, uh, you know, 50 miles, uh, 100 miles, and I'll still do that, especially if I'm by myself. You have to um, take those precautions. And, and then when I get back to the vehicle, I call back in and say, so I'm back in the vehicle. Each agency can have different policies on wearing the uniform near the border. You and your supervisor will need to discuss what options you may have, dressing in plain clothes or wearing the uniform. Here are some ways to look at either side of the issue. There's a controversy over it. My personal feeling on it is that from a safety standpoint, most of the people out in the woods realize that we're Forest Service, that we're not Border Patrol, we're not law enforcement, we're Forest Service. And if they identify us as that, then that reduces the threat level to them. And people tend to uh, uh, be a little less aggressive. They know that we work, you know, unarmed. They know that we're not dealing with uh, all sorts of miscellaneous wrongdoing, but that basically we're dealing with the natural resource issues. So my personal feeling is that the uniform contributes to safety because it identifies us, people know what we're doing, and they don't mistake us for law enforcement. All right, so I didn't. So we'll pound one. I could check the truck, though. There might be some. I have uh, the denim shirt that identifies this. I want to uh, be able to identify myself. Uh, I'm a Hispanic, and if I didn't have um, some form of, I feel, ID on me of my uniform, I could easily be mis mistaken for by the militia and be harassed possibly. There's times when I feel strongly having some form of ID, but like if I'm in uh, more northern areas, uh, the shirt uh, or the jacket may not be that necessary, but I always try to wear my field shirt that has the, the emblem on it of some form of ID on it. Our district ranger here has left it to our discretion. We kind of covered it in job hazard analysis as to whether we use uh, uniforms or not. Some of us prefer not to use uniforms because we don't want to be portrayed as a law enforcement officer. In Mexico, a law enforcement presence could come in any kind of a uniform. So they see a uniform as authority and as law enforcement. And so, you know, we try to stay in plain clothes. And if you do run into somebody, at least in some of our thoughts, are a lot less likely to be aggressive towards you. You know, if, if they're aggressive towards law enforcement people, if they're doing something wrong, they're going to try to get away. But if they see you just as a citizen or somebody out working out in the field, they aren't going to be near as threatened, I don't believe, from somebody in, in plain clothes. Finally, employees stress the need to remain alert and avoid complacency. Over time, um, it's real easy for our employees to get complacent um, because they deal in that kind of environment. They see undocumented immigrants almost every time they come out to the field, and a lot of times nothing happens. Um, and so you get to the point where it's kind of like being in bear country and you're seeing bears all the time. Um, you really don't take any of it real seriously until the first time you get chased up a tree um, or in, until the first time you get chewed on. Um, and then it gets a little bit more respect from you. And, of course, those are the kinds of instances that we don't want to have happen. So we're constantly fighting a complacency as well as a lack of knowledge or understanding of what this environment holds for people. Well, I think one of the ways we fight complacency is basically back through training. Periodically, we'll talk about the uh, situations hard that we've developed on the border, and uh, we brief off of that. And so I think teaching it is one of the best ways of actually making people more aware and less complacent. So I think we try to attack it from several different points of view. And if um, we see people being um, maybe a little bit too liberal, I think we're also in a mode where we would tell somebody that, hey, you probably shouldn't have stopped to help that person, or um, I was really worried about you in this kind of environment, or you forgot to check out. And, um, you know, so then we had to call you up on the radio and find out where you were at. And 
and I think just express some of that additional concern because it's real easy to get complacent, um, but I think a lot of our people are more used to having people complacent around border issues. So we're, we, we kind of watch out for ourselves too. Longer term employees often feel, the dilemma we have is that they feel very safe here because they've worked here for 15 years and they feel that the desert hasn't changed that much. There's just a you know little new influence. And so they, they often feel that they know how to deal with things and therefore the safety protocols can get in their way. We keep the conversation always going with the employees about the safety protocol and why we're doing it. Our hope is that through this, the training that we continue to do and the re-verification of the safety protocol, that people will, if they do get into a situation, they'll think about it and say, oh yeah, I remember I was trained to back out of the situation and to get help immediately so that they don't continue to think that, you know, they're, they're fine. While working near or along the U.S.-Mexico border, you may encounter drug smugglers or illegal immigrants at any time. As a result, employees feel they need to take extra precautions to avoid these situations. Here are some specific work practices you can use to keep safe. First, let's listen to the importance of working closely with Border Patrol. I guess the best thing if somebody were to come down here and they're not used to this, they come from an area that doesn't have these issues, that you need to get with those agencies that deal with this on a daily basis and coordinate with them and talk to them and find out where their issue areas are and, and try to get as much intelligence from them as you possibly can gain. And we talk frequently with the agents to see you know, what their activity level is, where their activity is, where their hot spots are. Are they having some issues? What they're seeing come across? Are they just the illegal immigrants coming across? Or are they seeing areas that are specifically where loads of drugs are coming across? And so if you know that type of thing, then you can be aware of that when you go into that area and, and you can sort of react to it, hopefully before you're surprised at the situation that it has occurred. In. Our big thing is on the coordination. You know, we send our employees down here there are safety procedures in place for them to come prepared. So they do the calling of the Border Patrol prior to arriving at the site. They give the vehicle description that they're in, the number of personnel that are with them. It's an extra step, but now because of the increased violence uh, potential here, it's better to take that up time and make the call and get the coordination. And the Border Patrol has been very helpful with that. And sometimes they'll even uh, be nearby while we're doing work, especially if there's been recent uh, violent incidences. Sometimes employees feel it is essential to have a law enforcement escort when working in the field. You know, we have a whole list of standard operating procedures for our staff. They're not allowed to go in some areas because they're too dangerous. They can go in there only with a law enforcement escort. If an employee is going into a high-risk area, uh, it's very appropriate to ask for an escort. Um, f few employees are willing to, to ask for that. I think there's some fear that they'll be seen as weak, or it's an intimidation thing, or it's not uh, macho. And so they won't ask for an escort, and that's unfortunate because it's made available. And particularly if it's a situation that, you know, there's current activity and we know that it's going on, you know, we can advise them, hey, if you're going to do this, maybe we ought to do it at a different time or maybe you should do it at a different day of the week. Or can you accomplish the same mission at a different location? So the employee should be willing uh, to ask for that. We're about 200 yards from, right now as we said, from some really um, uh, criminal activities that are going on just south of us here. So that you have to be pretty vigilant and make sure that uh, you're in complete contact with your office, you have an escort with you. We have a maternity cave for an endangered bat on the refuge and we monitor the numbers and in doing so at night there is law enforcement present. The interesting thing is law enforcement likes doing it too. It's a bit of a change and they're, they're resource oriented and they help out the biologists from time to time. A lot of times our law enforcement has degrees in wildlife biology or wildlife management or some resource subject, so it's enjoyable for them. 
because of the number of arrests near or along the border. Employees are at risk of finding themselves in the middle of law enforcement pursuits and apprehensions. Here's what you can do to avoid getting caught up in these situations. Typically, if, if we have situations on the refuge where there's uh, law enforcement involved in, in apprehension or some kind of activity, we you know, do our best to stay out of it. If we come up upon it, we get out of there and not, not get ourselves involved. We've had some employees who have actually been out in the field um, doing resource monitoring and have gotten in the middle of a pursuit, Border Patrol pursuing a number of immigrants, and the immigrants swarmed around these people, our, our staff, who are not in uniform. Um, and basically our, our people tried to move off to the side as quickly as they can, which was perfect, and they radioed in immediately that they were in the area, that they were in the middle of this pursuit so that our rangers could notify Border Patrol that we had people and staff in the area. And again, that's, the communication is so important so that we can get that information to, to Border Patrol. The other part of it is on our backcountry roads, um, often law enforcement, Border Patrol is either moving at high speeds, either because they're in pursuit or they're moving to a different location. One of the things that we tell employees to look for are the dust plumes in the distance. And if they see a dust plume, is to find a place to pull off the road. They don't know whether there's a pursuit going on or whether it's just a, a normal activity going on. But to always be assuming that there's potential for an encounter of some kind and that they need to get their vehicle off the road and get out of the way so that they're not in danger of being in an accident. Yeah, we're really vigilant on these roads. We go a little slower and make sure and stay the inside of your your um, side of the road because they're really only one lane, 15 mile an hour roads. Their chases are a real thing, more at night than during the day. Another thing to be aware of in this area especially, um, you wouldn't think of it being a, a riverine environment in the area that we, we're in. It's very typical for people to drive across this river. So when you're in this area, be cognizant of vehicles being driven across because um, the people driving them won't swerve out of the way to avoid you. Their main concern is to get their commodity into the interior of the United States and they'll do it by hook or by crook. They will take you out and there have been many instances where this has happened. They'll just drive right into traffic and when you're in this area, you're traffic. Anytime employees leave a vehicle in the field, it could attract illegal immigrants or drug smugglers who need supplies or a ride. Here are some of the precautions employees take. Whenever you go out to the field, you park your truck nose out. So that means if you ever need to jump in the truck, it's ready to go, you're ready to get out. You don't have to back up or anything like that. You are ready to get out of that situation as quick as possible. We lock the truck every time we leave it for, you know, if we're more than like five inches away, <laughs> um, we, we lock the truck. I suppose someone could take off with it, um, and that is something you know we do think about, but I can't spend my time worrying about whether or not my truck's gonna get stolen. If I'm leaving the truck, I obviously take everything I would possibly need with me out. So we always have our communication stuff on us, and we always have water and food for the day. It's about the best you can do. You can't prevent that from happening. You can just protect yourself by leaving it locked and just hoping nobody needs a truck that day. We tell all the staff, lock the vehicle. Uh, we have security bars, you know, the, the steering wheel locks. We put those on. Some of our vehicles have disabling devices on them. So we, we do that. It's, you know, physical security for the, the truck. Well, if I'm leaving a vehicle, I never go anywhere more than a, maybe a couple hundred yards away from the vehicle unless I've got a map, compass, and a GPS, and a pair of binoculars, and my radio. Those are my lifelines along with water are essential for getting along out here. We try to lock everything up inside the vehicle. Like a lot of the engines, they'll keep their two-week packs on top of the vehicles or their, you know, overnight gear. And we tell them to put everything either in one of the side boxes or lock it up in the front of the truck so those things don't get stolen on project work. We advise people not to leave a vehicle overnight. Be dropped off, have somebody come back and get you if possible. If a vehicle has to be left for an extended period of time, we advise putting water outside the vehicle because more than likely that's what uh, illegal aliens are going to be looking for and they're not likely to damage the vehicle if what they need is water. However, be prepared for that vehicle maybe to be vandalized or not there on your return. Therefore, you need a stash of water 
for yourself. Take adequate water, stash it somewhere else away from the, the vehicle. If you're not carrying a radio, stash a radio there or something. Wipe out your footprints uh, you know, if you can, but have some sort of contingency plan should you come back and the, and the vehicle uh, is gone. So many times people have come back and their truck is either gone or somebody's trying to steal it or hotwire it and those are interesting situations. What we tell the staff is look the government truck is not worth it. Just if somebody you come back to the truck somebody's trying to steal it you know go the other way. Just get on the handheld radio, call in, get somebody to come get you but don't go in there trying to to be a hero and save the government truck. It's not worth the risk. Also, you don't come back to your vehicle blindly. You know, just like with the canyons. You find some place, you look, look around, see what's going on. Does it look like anybody has messed with anything? If not, then okay, go ahead and approach it. It's just a matter of being careful, that's all. Without putting too much of a dramatic emphasis on it, I also am always watching for escape routes. If I leave the vehicle and I come back, uh, there's people milling around the vehicle that I don't want to involve myself with. Where am I going to go from here? And so I've usually always got myself a secondary route, uh, either get out to Ruby Road or get to a place where I can call dispatch. Experienced employees have found the best way to protect themselves is to avoid dangerous encounters altogether. They pay attention to the red flags that indicate illegal immigrants or drug smugglers are in the area and immediately leave. The kind of stuff we're going to see here would be the, the kind of warning flag you'd be wanting to pay attention to in the field. It lets you know that people are using the area and they could be there now. Some of the things that we watch for when you come on a site like this is to be aware of things like can you hear voices nearby, do you smell cigarette smoke, marijuana smoke, anything of that nature, um, food containers, a tuna can. If you, if you can stand here and you can still smell the tuna in the can, you can see wet tuna juice in it, you know that the people are, are not that far ahead of you and they may be very nearby. You need to back off. You can run into a lot of different kinds of things. Um, a lot of uh, burlap and other kinds of things that you know are associated with drug smuggling overlap and are open, and um, there's several other indicators that you may be in a high traffic area for drugs, other places where you find mostly clothing and, and water bottle and food substances and that kind of thing are going to be more probably associated with undocumented immigrants. There's different signs you look for, um, like uh, they put uh, cans, uh, trail to trail, mark their trail, the, they'll put like um, soda cans or beer cans on the edge of the tree branch. And anything like that, that you know, it's a marker. So you know that you're traveling uh, or traversing near a path of, of theirs. So you just, um, you just be careful. Just being aware of your surroundings. I patrol with the windows down and the air conditioner off. That way I can hear, smell, and see. If I'm out walking around, I'm looking at what's going on around me. I'm looking for anything that's out of place. Does that pile of rocks look like it? just happened or does it look like somebody piled them up there? If so, why do you think they did? Is that a mining monument? Is it somebody's trail marker? What is it? You just stop and think about those things. You don't dwell on these things, but you notice them and you pay attention to them and they will give you clues as to the situation you're in. What we're looking at here is a, a well-used and well-known foot trail too in the park. Um, that has some recent foot traffic on it that our chief ranger pointed out here for us. You can see a really well-defined sneaker print here and a different tread over there. It's a group of people that came through today sometime. And this is an example of the kind of thing that we would be looking for in the backcountry when we're walking around. What we do in a situation like this is to react same as if uh, you see trash piles or other evidence is suddenly go on a, a higher level of alert assume that there could be people very nearby and they could uh, be trying to evade being seen and, and you could be possibly the, the enemy or the interdiction forces. What I normally would do working out here is just kind of stop, take a deep breath, look around and start paying very close attention to all my senses. You know, can you hear anything? Do you hear people talking? Can you smell anything? Um, 
Are there ravens in the area? We've, we've learned here that ravens have learned to key in on trash piles in large groups of migrants because they can scavenge some of the, the trash that they leave behind. So if you see groups of ravens clustered in a tree or circling low, maybe over a large wash, it might mean that there are people there or there's at least a trash site there. Animal activity usually ceases around the presence of, uh, of humans. If the birds all of a sudden go quiet or if birds all of a sudden fly up next to you, just be aware that there's something out there that startled them away. Another thing is noise. You can hear the vehicles as they drive across. The uh, foot traffic. The, the foot traffic that's coming across will generally just try and avoid you. They'll hide and they'll, um, they'll lay down in the bushes and, uh, and try and avoid you. Be aware of your surroundings. Don't just be blindly walking down a trail. Keep your wits about you. I advise people, if it doesn't feel right, it probably isn't. If you get this uneasy feeling or the hair in the back of your neck sticks up, it's time to, to get out. And uh, there's nothing out there worth risking your life or your well-being. Employees sometimes feel uncertain when they encounter people in the field because they just don't know who they are dealing with. It could be just a visitor, but it also could be an illegal immigrant, a coyote, or even a drug smuggler. As a result, they stay alert and keep an eye out for signs that people aren't who they appear to be. It's really hard sometimes to decipher, you know, who's who out there. Distinguish between just an immigrant coming into this country for work versus somebody who's smuggling drugs, unless they're carrying it on their back. People even ask me at times, well, how do you know they're smugglers? How do you know they're immigrants? And, um, and, and to be honest, I, ca I can't know that 100%. I really can't. I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty certain when you see people with backpacks walking across the desert with water jugs that you've encountered immigrants. But in terms of actual smugglers, generally the coyotes blend right in with everybody else. You won't know until you see someone driving a vehicle or until you see somebody up at the front of the group. If you actually see the group where someone's leading a line of people, that person is the coyote. You don't know who the smuggler is at most times. Um, when we do capture a group that has a smuggler leading it, uh, he will do his best to blend in. And um, before they even start, many of the aliens that we've interviewed have told us, he's, he told me if I pointed him out as a smuggler that they would go and get my family. And uh, so that's, uh, they threaten them before they come across with uh, bodily harm and harm to their families. The people from this side of the border that are coming to pick up the material, however, can be very, very dangerous. You have to be very careful about dealing with them, about getting hooked up with them. Uh, they tend to pretend to be something else if they're out there. Usually they'll be you know, trying to act like campers or act like bird watchers or something of this nature. And uh, uh, you have to pay attention, make sure that you're watching what's going on, to try and determine whether the people that you're talking to are really what they say they are. And I get a lot of reptile collectors out there, and uh, these two guys were trying to tell me they were reptile collectors, but they had no collection bins. They had no snake hooks. They had absolutely none of the gear that would normally be associated with this. So it was pretty clear to me that they weren't collecting reptiles. Uh, if they had caught any, they had no place to put them. A situation like that, it's pretty obvious that they're pretending to be something that they're not. And it's not our job to figure out what that is. It's our job to recognize that this is a situation that is not necessarily what it appears to be. And at that point, uh, it's beyond the scope of what we do deal with. We'll turn it over to the, to the people that do deal with that. The person that's broken down with the vehicle that looks like they're the, the, uh, the mom and pop out to you know, look at the birds and so forth, because we had a lot of bird watching here. We've had that stage several times as a stage breakdown where, oh no, they've already called somebody else and you know, they're just waiting for them to show up and we don't need any help. And what they are is to look out for the smuggler. Um, and if you look on the front seat, a lot of times you're going to find out they've got three or four cell phones and maybe a two-way radio. 
um, and uh, possibly a lot of times a firearm um, right there in the front seat of the vehicle. And and uh, but you can't tell that from the real legitimate person that's broken down beside the road. The things that that I look for to raise my level of uh, concern about a campsite. First of all, is their attitude. Are they nervous about you being there? You look for either anything that is there that shouldn't be there, an excessive number of containers, anything like that, things that would not normally be associated with camping. Or you look for something that's not there that should be there. Do they have tents? Do they have sleeping bags? Do they have the things that you would normally expect to find in a campsite? Is the campfire being used? If it's not being used, is there a charcoal grill or a gas stove around? Uh, are they appropriately dressed? Do they have the proper the shoes are a dead giveaway. If they have city shoes on out there in the woods, they're almost certainly not camping. What type of vehicles are they? You, know, you can tell when a vehicle belongs in the woods uh, and when it's normally not supposed to be there. What I do is just look at their cars, because you're not going to have, a, especially down here, a Cadillac Escalade camping you know, in the middle of nowhere. $50,000 car just for nothing in the woods, and that happens. When we're patrolling in Agua Fria Canyon, I seen a Corvette in there. Why well, you want a Corvette in the middle of the road? You see, like this car right here. What's he doing here? There's no hiking trails, no nothing around here. And they load drugs out of that canyon. Right there. If you look, if you pay attention on the fence, you can see it's all bent up when they push it down to cross over. And they're like right there, you see that hole? On this forest and on these districts, you cannot ever let it slip out of your head because it has to be there. Every time you get on a forest road, every time you see a vehicle parked on the side of the road, you don't know whether it's some nice public person that pays their taxes or somebody's parked a vehicle there for some other reason. Despite all the precautions employees take to avoid encounters, on occasion they still run into illegal immigrants, drug smugglers, or drug stashes. Let's hear what they do to get out of these situations. If you encounter illegal migrants in the backcountry, I'll usually stop moving and start backing off but do things without even thinking about it like putting up your hands and showing that you're no threat and that you're no danger kind of universal sign language to to back off just to try to defuse the situation until you can get it managed by calling in help or, or whatever is appropriate be cognizant of where you're at and what's around you because yeah most of us do that anyway but here it's even more important because we've had range people out riding come up on a drug load and so what do you do well you just push your horse on through and hope they forget about you because like it or not we try to make them feel like that we're not their enemy we're out here doing a job and then when you get to a point where it makes sense and you let somebody know you saw them but just work through them work around them ignore them because we want them to know that we're not out here running enforcement on them My coworker and I were working in a, like a bosky area, a pretty heavily dense area with a lot of mesquite trees. And we were picking up trash in there because we knew there was a lot of trash in that one site. And all of a sudden, she, she wasn't near me any longer because we usually try to stay pretty close together when we're working um, just for safety. And um, I, all of a sudden, I heard male voices that were speaking Spanish. And I was like, I couldn't see her. I couldn't see them. Nothing. And I was like, oh, goodness. <laughs> What am I supposed to do? So we just, we both have uh, walkie-talkies, and so I got on and I just, just asked her if everything was okay, if she needed any more trash bags, you know, what was going on, and, you know, and so we just kept talking because it was like we wanted to increase our feeling of security and let them know that we had a way to communicate with each other, and, um, but that was probably one of the most scary incidences, just not being able to see people. The favorite technique that I like to use to disengage from one of these questionable contacts is I will ask them what they have seen in the woods. The common thing is quad traffic. Well, you know, you guys have been out here. Have you seen any quad traffic around? You know, normally I got a bunch of them out here. We're trying to keep them under control. It usually works pretty well to get the 
conversation around to things that you would expect us to be involved in and keep it at that level. It never hurts to play dumb. Body language, you know, facial expression. Uh, they expect us, like I say, to be, you know, friendly forest ranger. You set up a legitimate excuse by typically by asking them if they have seen this. And that gives you a good reason to, you know, a reason that doesn't trigger any suspicion when you go ahead and leave. If you come into contact with an illegal border crosser, the standing order is that you don't approach them. When you find yourself in a situation where it appears to be maybe illegal migrants or even drug smugglers, you go the other way. And then you call law enforcement as soon as possible and let them know. We advise our employees that if they see drug smugglers or undocumented immigrants and so forth to get away from that particular environment before they actually call the situation in if they can because they can just draw unnecessary attention to them. If you come across stashed drugs or sometimes lost drugs, part of a drug load might get lost in the dark. The safe thing to do is to assume that the drug smugglers are nearby because um, that's very often likely to be the case. It fits their, their method of operation is that they, when they rest during the day, they hide in the shade during the daytime and they'll, they'll stash the drugs in a wash, cover it with brush or something. So if you find something that even looks like it's been buried and may have been there for a long time, it may have been there just a few hours and it's just the safest thing to do is to assume that they are nearby, but they're watching it. Get out of the area and call it into the law enforcement staff as soon as you can. A difficult situation employees face when working along the border is coming across people who are in distress and need aid. These people may need food, water, or be suffering from heat stroke. The question employees struggle with is whether or not to help. It definitely is at the discretion of the employee. There's no cookbook. There can't be a cookbook because every situation is completely different. If you see somebody in the trail that's in just total distress, um, you're going to offer them water. Some of our employees are, are EMTs so that they can they can provide medical care if, if it's really needed. But you also have to be careful because sometimes people may act as if they're in distress and you don't know. You don't know if that's the situation is that there's they're acting out something. In general we advise people and we follow this advice ourselves is to have as little contact as possible with illegal immigrants. It's hard to pass up these people and know that they're in distress or have, have a need of, of some sort, but you never know if they're up to no good. You don't know if the person trying to flag you down might be a decoy. It has happened that people have stopped for someone who's flagging them down and then they'll yank the person out of the car and take off in their vehicle. It can get dangerous really quick and we just try to avoid those type of individuals, whether it be UDAs or, or just people walking down, like down this road here, if we've fallen five or six people, they may try waving you down and need some help, but it's probably more, more prudent to go a little further, get on the radio, call our dispatchers, tell them, hey, I, found, I see six individuals are walking south on Ruby Road, give them a um, GPS reading and go on your way and do your work. It is not legal for us at any moment to transport anyone in the desert. That's why we have the communications that we have. The Border Patrol feels that it is very unsafe for us to do this because most likely they're going to be able to provide more on-site help than we would. All the things we heard about in this module take an emotional toll on employees, both at work and at home. They get stressed, disappointed, and frustrated. But they have found ways to take care of themselves and remain committed to their work. That the Border Patrol called and said, we see a white vehicle out there and it looks good for something. And they were on their One way, way we deal with the stress here is, is just by continually sharing the stories of what people are dealing with and, and talking to each other about how to deal with those things. We have fitness equipment so that people can maintain a fitness program. We do a lot of celebrations where we have celebrations for benchmarks that we've hit, like the building of a vehicle barrier fence, the completion of that. We had a big celebration, um, luncheon, to celebrate those kinds of things that are directly related to the border, but they're big 
projects that everybody's contributed towards. And I, that's, that's really what we're finding is the important part of appreciating each other and awarding each other for the hard work that everybody's doing, understanding that it's under extremely stressful situations. And then the EAP program, the Employee Assistance Program, is always available. And that's always suggested to employees, too, in terms of taking advantage of that, which can be a, a real help for employees that need to discuss their emotional response to the situation. We're a very typical ranger district. It is kind of a family-oriented thing, and I think people talking about some of the instances that they see out there and you know some of the stressors and so forth. And so I think a lot of communication back and forth and just comparing notes and keeping people aware of the environment is a good thing to relieve stress because communication is a real good way of reducing it. If you're talking about it with somebody that lives in the same kind of environment you do, they're going to understand you. And if you talk to to somebody that has never been in that kind of environment, you know, they're either not going to believe you or they won't know how to relate to it. I've had really good support with my supervisor um, because she had worked in the field for a couple of years before I got here. So she's really good about asking us how we're doing, if everything's okay. Um, I have a really good support network of friends and family um, that I can talk to about anything that happens. I was fascinated by this migration of humans um, willing to risk everything, everything that you could possibly have to come here. And so I think through my own kind of studies and investigations and reading, that's kind of helped me to understand it. Despite all the problems employees face along the border, they still find their jobs meaningful. It's disheartening. To, to say the least, because uh, the employees are dedicated. It isn't a job, it's a profession. For many, it's a calling. So it, it's pretty distressing to see the damage. It impacts our ability to uh, manage the area, uh, to protect the area. So it, it's extremely disheartening. But rather than look at it as the glass half empty, well, it's half full. At least we're here. At least we can have a positive influence. At least we can work with Homeland Security and Border Patrol and try and minimize the damage and then hopefully eventually put the patient back together again. Personally, I believe in the wildlife refuge system and protecting our public lands and our habitat for wildlife. And um, if we were to just throw up our arms and leave this area and let Border Patrol or immigrants take it over, it would be in much worse shape. So I believe we're playing a very important role in maintaining and managing these lands for wildlife and keeping it in the best condition that we can. First and foremost, I love the lands. I love it here. I love being outside. I grew up on the country, and so for me, this is my respite from being surrounded by people and buildings and asphalt and concrete. And I think it's totally necessary to human health to be outside and to be surrounded by nature. I get to come out and work in a beautiful place every day and learn more about the, the interrelationships between the plants and the animals and the soil and, and those kinds of things make me excited to be here and to learn about that and share that with other people. I love working with kids and showing them, um, helping them to learn more about their environment and so my favorite, my favorite part of this job is, is the class groups being able to, you know, I guess share my love of this place and, and all of the amazing mysteries and questions and beauty that it has to offer is totally worth it. In this module, you heard how employees maintain their personal safety while working near the border, despite the prevalence of drug smuggling and illegal immigration. Working near the border can be a difficult and disheartening place for employees who serve the public and are dedicated to the land. However, one of the most important messages you can take away from this module is that you can maintain your safety near the border while still enjoying your job and the beauty of where you work.